I'm so last time, if you didn't see last time, you should see last time, where I introduced normal forms for vector fields near equilibria. We're going to continue on that today. Um, this is, we'll be doing most of today on dependence on parameters, just like we did center manifolds dependence on parameters. We'll look at normal forms dependence on parameters and a famous one uh, related to a bifurcation, the Hopf bifurcation. This is the bifurcation where a, uh, if you have a, a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues and it crosses the imaginary axis, uh, either from left to right or right to left, you get you can get a, a periodic orbit showing up. So a sort of a periodic orbit is born from a equilibrium point. Um, but before I, I do that, I wanted to mention something uh, that I haven't really seen in textbooks, which is the, it's a geometric interpretation of what a normal form is. So last time I was saying a, a normal form is a nonlinear change of variables that simplifies the nonlinear terms. And so what is a, what, what's going on there? I, I just I want to give you an example. This this example, um, just a two D one that kind of comes from mechanics. If we have our our x uh, phase space and x one dot equals x two, so x one is like a position and x two is like a velocity, and then x two dot is negative x one. That would be the simple harmonic oscillator. But suppose we add in now a nonlinear term. We can, we can do a change of variables from x1 to y1, y2. So go from the x to the y similar to how we have done things. So this goes to uh, you know, y plus h2, y. I guess it's, this is more of an equals over here. We can pick this, pick h2 to uh, eliminate the second order terms. And if we do that, then this goes to y1 dot equals uh, y2. So we don't change the first order terms at all. The first order terms are already in um, Jordan canonical form. y2 dot equals negative y1. And we don't have any second or order terms. I think what we will have actually in both slots is third order terms but we've eliminated second order terms. So we've pushed things off into uh, higher order terms. And remember, we're, we're thinking about what are the dynamics near an equilibrium? In this case, the equilibrium we have in mind is the, the origin. So origin is the equilibrium of interest. And we're doing a nonlinear change of variables. I won't give what it is explicitly, but I did want to give you a, a picture of uh, what is going on here? Uh, not it. I think it's here. There we go. So this is a picture of the original phase space in X, and now we've got the phase space. Uh, these are con. These are this is the mesh of points in, in Y. So this is the Y1, Y2 grid. And you'll see it's not linear, it's nonlinear. Things are deforming. But on this grid, um, so each of these lines, this is, uh, I guess this would be Y1 equals a constant along those lines. And along these other lines, that's Y2 equals a constant. So the, the normal form, 
like a remeshing of phase space. So that in the new variables, the dynamics are simpler. And you know, it would have been hard to guess ahead of time what this remeshing looks like. But uh, so in the original x variables, we have this dynamics and we have a second order term. In now transforming to the y variables, we've eliminated the second order term. And all we have is something that's first order. It's first order and it looks like the simple harmonic oscillator to leading order in this new deformed um, meshing of phase space. So it's a change of variables. If you were to look in the you know, y1, y2 space to leading order, right? We have an equilibrium point at, at the origin and the dynamics um, look like just this simple harmonic oscillator. So in the, you could then transform back to the original phase space and you'd have like deformed circles if you want. Um, and you could repeat this process, right? You could, uh, I said yesterday, you could change the second order terms uh, or remove the second order terms or as, as many as possible. Um, you could also do the same to eliminate third order terms and so on. This, this process can just keep, keep going on. So are there questions about that? To me, it's been, it's helpful to have this geometric perspective. Like this is what a, a normal form does. It finds the nonlinear transformation that puts in the new coordinates, your equations as simple as possible. I have a couple questions. Yeah. So the first is that looks like a conformal mapping. Are normal forms always conformal mappings? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know the, the, the connection between them. There might be. Because and, and, and it is it is local. Um, we're just doing things locally near the uh, near the origin. The reason I was wondering, but I guess if it's local, it probably isn't this, is because you know, like when you in fluid dynamics, when you're solving for the flow over an airfoil, you transform the problem into the flow over a sphere. But I don't think that's the yeah. same thing here because this is only local, right? Yeah, but I mean, there's definitely. There's definitely similarities. That's a good okay. point. All right. Um, anything else? Okay. Since I did mention transforming the to eliminate and simplify the third order terms, I'm going to cover that and then we'll go into the example. Um, so if you Remember yesterday we talked about, or last time, we talked about simplifying the second order terms. And you could just continue that, that process. So you could simplify the third order terms and the fourth order terms. But let's look at, at this because it's, it's needed for what we're going to do next. Um, after we've simplified, let me just show where we are. After simplifying, second order terms our system will look like bring that to the top our system will look like this y dot equals j y so that's the j is the Jordan canonical form um, and then we'd be left with what were called the resonance terms or kind of the remaining terms, the ones you can't eliminate, the second order terms you cannot eliminate, uh, then plus the third order terms. And then there'd be fourth order terms and so on, but we won't deal with that. Uh, another thing about the this approach to normal forms is that every time you uh, simplify uh, the nth order terms, it doesn't do anything to everything n minus one uh, or less. So when we simplified the second order terms, it didn't affect the first order terms. Now when we simplify the third order terms, it won't be affecting the second or the first order, order terms. So those remain the same. And that's why, that's how this process can work. 
So this is what we're left with. Our goal we want is that we want to simplify these. So just like the approach yesterday, we will turn this into a, even though these are nonlinear terms, we will turn the problem of finding the transformation into a linear problem in the appropriate vector space and look at the, the image of a linear map and its complement. So we introduce a another uh, near identity transformation. And this one will look like, so y goes to y plus h3 y. h3 are homogeneous polynomials of order three. And it's okay, these are vector valued. Let me just say it up here, y is in R n. So we have vector valued polynomials of order three on Rn. Okay, then just like last time, uh, we take the time derivative of this, y dot plus d h three y times y dot. And we'll just write what that is in terms of matrices, my dh3y, it's a Jacobian, and this all, we've got, we've got that. Um, let me just write this, because we're going to need it. The, the inverse of this matrix, we can write it out uh, as a, 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 a Norman series. It looks a lot like what you get for the Taylor series. It's the n by n identity matrix minus dh3y uh, plus, and dh3y is the second order term. It's second order in y. So that's as far as we'll go with this approximation. There would be third order, fourth order, and so on terms. We'll stop there. Um, so doing this transformation, we have, we've got the, we'll just, we're substituting into this simplified equation up here. And what do we get? So on the right hand side, it'll be J times, instead of Y, it'll be Y plus H3Y. So J, y plus j h3 y and then the second order terms will be it'll be a function of y plus h3 y same for the third order terms function of y plus h3 y and all higher order terms. All right, we'll multiply both sides by the inverse um, and do the usual kind of thing that we're gonna do. So, um, um, what is it? We get y dot uh, equals And I, I'm gonna skip steps. You could look in the book if you wanna see this. Y plus F three Y plus things of order four. Um, and you might be wondering, you know, what happened to, what happened to this thing? Well, F 
two R Y. Oops. plus h3 y is going to be f2 r y plus and what would the next term be the next term is going to be at least of order four so we're just lumping in into that over there same thing f3 of y plus h3 y is going to be uh, the leading order term will be this and then we'll have a term that's um, the next one will be. Think about this. I think it's order five, so it just sort of goes away. All right. So now this is we've got our, our linear term, our second order term. All of these are third order terms. So just like last time, we can write this as, um, we'll write it in the form of AX equals B, where then we can solve for, um, well, we first look to see if the operator A is full rank and go from there. So. So this gives, um, we're looking for L J three of uh, H three, it's a three, H three Y equals negative F three tilde of Y. Um, this right hand side, right, is in the space, capital H3, of homogeneous polynomials of order three on Rn. Um, this is also in H3. What is Lj3? So our linear operator here is J h3 y minus d h3 y j y and this thing is a linear map from h3 capital h3 to capital h3 so if this is just like with the ax equals b it's a classic linear algebra problem um, if if this linear operator is invertible, then all third order terms can be eliminated. And the way that we would check for that is we would uh, apply LJ3 on all of the basis elements of capital H3 and see what happens. And then we would, you can construct a, a matrix. Uh, so, you know, to check to see if this is invertible, you see if the matrix representation is full rank. And if it's not invertible, that's okay. It just means you've simplified as much as possible. If not, right, then we can write H3, the vector space of all uh, polynomials of order three is going to be, we could write it as, this is the image of H3 under the linear operator plus its complement. And if you remember how we did things last time, we wrote that the image I guess this would be of H of F3 is in here. And then these would be all of the remaining terms and we'll just call it uh, FR. 
remaining and actually the r stands for for historical reasons i still don't quite get resonant i m stands for image so that means that um we've simplified the third order terms to just f r 3 so our our ODE after now applying uh, the original ODE, we first got it by putting it in Jordan canonical form. So that was a linear transformation. Then we did a second order transformation to eliminate as many of the second order terms as possible. Now we've done a third order transformation. So we would be left with that where we've simplified the second and third order terms and then right everything else would be order four and you could continue you know what is what do i mean by order four well this would be just all of the terms you now have that are order four so you could continue this all right you could eliminate or I mean, simplify fourth order terms. Professor? Yes. Did you mean to write order five at the end of the box equation? Yeah, thank you. So this would just go, go on and on, where you would have F, the order K terms that remain are all in the complement of that order. And I I believe, although I haven't used it, I, I would assume there is software out there that does this. And if not, we could try to find it. Um, I mean, even for simple problems, doing it by hand up to second or third order can be a little bit tedious. Uh, it becomes nice to have putting in an appendix of a paper to impress people, but um, and there, I guess if you're the if you're the first one to do it, then you could call it a normal form and name it after yourself. Yeah. Are there problems for problems for which you can take the limit and kind of get an exact simplification for n equals like n going to infinity terms? I mean, from what I've seen, this you always push off terms. Um, it's sort of like you know how when we would simplify the linear terms. It always made the second order terms more complicated, uh, um, and that just seems to be the, the case. So it's it's as if you're always pushing it off, and because we're talking about near the, the neighborhood of the origin, those terms are less and less Im important. And that's okay. why this is a local method. Um, there may be people who have looked at global normal forms, but I I'm, I'm just not familiar with that. So okay. this is all local. But that's okay, you know, you gotta start somewhere. And if there are any new equilibria or interesting solutions that show up, you know, if there are any bifurcations that show up near the equilibrium point of interest, um, that's kind of what we're focused on. So local bifurcation theory, which then leads me to, you know, the next thing that I wanted to look at, um, Normal forms that depend on parameters, but I'll look at the, the main example, which is the normal form for the hop bifurcation. And there's some there's some tricks related to this, so it's it's good to do. Um, so normal forms that depend on parameters. And this is in, so this is section 19.2 of Wiggins 2003 book. Um, so we'll look at a main example, which is the hop bifurcation. 
I guess this would be the normal form for the Hopf bifurcation. So the uh, the main thing that this is related to is when you have a, if you've got a system and it could be in N dimensions, but when you look at the, the eigenvalues, if you have a pair of eigenvalues, which are on the imaginary axis, then in general, so unless there's some special structure to your system, and Hamiltonian systems, in fact, have this special structure, but in general, you would have um, uh, crossing, you have this complex conjugate pair crossing the imaginary axis, and maybe it's going left or it's going right, I don't know, but it depends on a parameter, a single parameter mu. So what, and um, like I said, this could happen in N dimensions, but then we're gonna focus on the two dimensional subspace that corresponds to the generalized eigenvectors for these, this complex conjugate pair. So without loss of generality, we can actually look at a system that looks like this, where X, is in R2 and mu is our single real parameter. And what are we assuming? We're going to assume that f of zero, zero is zero. What does this mean? This means there's an equilibrium point at x equals zero, zero. So the origin in this 2D phase space at a parameter value of mu equal to zero. And not only that, but the Jacobian of F with respect to X evaluated at the origin and at the parameter value zero has two purely imaginary eigenvalues. Strangely, I was getting a phone call. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Uh, okay, we're back. Um, how do I make that not happen? All right. So this matrix has two purely imaginary eigenvalues. And plus or minus I omega. And, you know, just to sort of imply that omega depends on mu, say this is evaluated at mu equals zero. So omega itself at zero is non-zero. All right. So then according to the implicit function theorem, there is a curve of equilibrium points, um, one equilibrium point for every value of, of mu. So there's a curve of equilibrium points, let's say x plus x of mu, and you know, we could even draw a little diagram of that if we want. Here's the x plane, and then here's the mu direction. There's some curve of equilibrium points. that uh, coincides with the origin by sort of definition. Um, and we're going to do, at each point, we'll do a transformation of you know, x minus x mu. 
the origin is always the equilibrium point. Okay, so now we will assume that we've changed the variables. And we'll keep the notation of writing things in terms of x instead of y. So x dot equals f of x and mu. Um, I'll write out the Jacobian evaluated at zero. It looks like this. So we're doing a change into the Jordan canonical form. For general mu, what would we have? So for a general value of the parameter, and we're still thinking of the, the parameter is going to be close to zero, uh, we would have the Jacobian, for some general value of mu is, and we've got the real part of the eigenvalue, and then negative of the imaginary part of the eigenvalue. This would be uh, Jordan canonical form. And we will write these, we'll write the real part as alpha and the imaginary part as omega. And now we're just explicitly putting in that this could depend on mu. Right, so we're just, we're writing the complex conjugate pair it's alpha plus I omega, right? And the, the eigenvalues of dx are mu and its complex conjugate. All right. Now, at this point, it's easier to work instead of having a two dimensional x, sort of separate it out and write it explicitly. So we're going to write x equals x and y. So now, you know, x and y represent the points in R2. And uh, not only are we going to do that, but because we're working in with a two dimensional system, it, it becomes easier to work with complex uh, coordinates. So despite my hesitation to work with complex coordinates, I'm going to do it. It's just easier to work with, you just, you define a complex coordinate. You know, Z equals X plus I Y. And then there's its complex conjugate, x minus i, y. Um, why is this going to be easier? It's it's going to be easier because then we instead of instead of two real ODEs, we have one complex ODE. And that'll just be easier to deal with for the uh, doing the transformation for normal forms. All right. So if if you wanted to write this in terms of a matrix, you could do this: z z bar equals one i one negative i x y. You could also write its inverse: x y equals one half, uh, one, one, negative i, i, z, z, transpose, they're not transpose, conjugate. Okay, 
So we'll work with Z. The ODE in complex coordinates is particularly simple. So instead of having a um, two by two matrix, now we can just write lambda mu z. That's the linear part, which is, that's cool. I like that. Um, and then second order terms can be written as functions of z and uh, z uh, bar and mu plus third order terms, which are functions of z, z bar, and mu. And that's as far as we'll go. Okay, so this is our, this is the ODE that we want to, uh, we want to simplify the second order terms. Um, all right. Simplify second order terms. So what's that going to look like? We do a transformation from Z. It's a near identity transformation. Z plus a homogeneous polynomial of now Z and Z bar. So now H2 over, if you want, H2 over uh, C is um, the terms we need to look at are Z squared, Z times Z bar, Z bar squared. So just three. Otherwise, when we did it in terms of the real variables, we had six six basis elements. Here we just have three basis elements and that's how things get simplified. All right, so then, then what? Well, if you take the time derivative of Z plus H2 Z, Z bar, you get Z dot one plus partial H2 partial Z um, but you can't, you can't get around that H2 also depends on Z bar. So we get a Z bar dot. Later we'll approximate what the Z bar dot is, but for now, that's that. Um, and then, then what? This equals lambda times Z plus lambda H2 plus F2, where the functional dependence of all those uh, things is understood. And then we'll just you know forget about order three terms for now. All right. Um, we'll move this term with the Z bar dot over to the right-hand side. And one plus partial H2 partial Z. We're gonna to have to take the inverse of that. And this is just like, it's like the complex version of a Taylor series because partial H2 partial Z is small. So we get that plus, that's a first order term. So the next terms would be second order. Um, so we get Z dot equals one minus partial H2, partial Z, these terms of order two, times lambda Z plus lambda H2. Um, and we, we still have this term, partial H2, partial Z bar, and Z bar dot plus F2, plus order three. All right. Um, what's the leading order term here? The leading order term is lambda Z. 
That's the only linear term. So that's the leading order term. And this implies that z bar dot, the leading order is lambda. You just take the complex conjugate of this ODE up here, you'll get uh, z bar dot equals lambda z, uh, or lambda bar z bar, just that, plus higher order terms. So then this tells us, okay, over here where we have a z bar dot, we could just substitute in lambda bar z bar plus terms of order two. All right. So then um, let me just keep writing this out. Plus lambda h two. Um, now minus lambda bar partial h two partial z bar z bar plus f two. Um, that's multiplying everything in this side by one. Now we have multiplied by negative partial h2 partial z. The only term that matters is this first one, negative lambda partial h2 partial z times z. And then everything else is order three. Okay. So this is what we've got. Um, now let's look at what are the second order terms. These are the second order terms. So what does that mean? We want to we want to choose this H2, this polynomial. So that lambda h2 minus, and I'll rearrange things a little bit here, lambda partial h2 partial z, z minus lambda bar partial h2 partial z bar, z bar plus f2 equals zero, right? If we could find an H2 that does that, then we could eliminate all of the second order terms. So this is, we could again, this is of the form AX equals B, where right, we'll group this, this becomes AX and this is negative b over here. And then if a is invertible, then we're good to go. Okay. So let me just remind you again, let me switch back to black. H2, what are the basis elements? Basis elements are z squared, z, z bar, z bar squared. And so let, maybe we'll also remind ourselves, this is element P1, element P2, basis element P3, because we're gonna construct a three by three matrix by looking at uh, what happens to each of these basis elements under this map, uh, lambda H2 minus lambda partial H2 partial Z times Z minus lambda bar partial h2 partial z bar, z bar, okay? This is a linear map. H2, H2. So this is the AX part. All right, so let's just apply this linear map to all of the basis elements. So for basis element, uh, P1 equals Z squared. What do we get? Uh, well, we get lambda Z squared minus uh, lambda two 
z times z minus, uh, well, z squared doesn't depend on z bar, so this is zero. So we get, we end up getting minus lambda z squared. If you want, this is minus lambda p1. So let's start constructing this, the matrix representation. So this gives us a negative lambda zero, zero for the first column. All right, zz bar, what do we get? Lambda zz bar minus lambda z bar times z minus uh, lambda bar um, z times z bar. Put all that together, we get negative First two terms cancel out and we're given just lambda bar C Z bar. So this looks like lambda, negative lambda bar P2. So lambda bar. Okay, this is starting to look like, if it's completely diagonal matrix, uh, then, then A is invertible. So that's good. All right, so now let, let's apply it to the third basis element. Lambda z bar squared minus lambda bar. Um, well, there's a zero if you want. Second term doesn't give us anything. Then we get lambda bar two z bar z bar. So what is this? It's lambda minus two lambda bar z bar squared, okay, lambda minus two lambda bar P3. So it's diagonal. Two lambda bar. So we, we evaluate lambda at mu equals zero. And lambda at zero is I omega zero. So that means that lambda bar at mu equals zero is negative I omega zero. And omega is non-zero. So lambda minus two lambda bar evaluated at mu equals zero is three I omega zero. So that means this matrix, um, or the linear operator is full rank. So that means all second order terms can be eliminated. I merged some words there. Eliminated. All right, cool. So now we've got z dot equals lambda z plus these things that are that were second order can all be eliminated. So that's zero. And then we're left with the third order terms. All right, so now, now we simplify the third order terms, still using the complex conjugate notation. Our ODE right, is now lambda z plus the next leading order is third order. And we'll try a transformation near identity, um, but with a third uh, order homogeneous polynomial. And now, what is what are the basis elements? The 
basis elements. It's just all the third order polynomials of Z and Z bar. So we have Z cubed, Z squared, Z bar, Z, Z bar squared, and then Z bar cubed. And we could do something, right? We write this out similar to before. C dot equals one minus partial H three partial Z plus the next leading order is order four times lambda Z plus lambda H three minus partial H three partial Z bar lambda bar Z bar plus F three So we'll get, there's the linear term. There won't be any second order terms. And then uh, we'll have some third order terms. This is H3 minus lambda bar partial H3 partial Z bar, Z bar plus F three. So these are the third order terms. Right, we want to pick H three to eliminate them. So we look at the linear map of H three to H three. Is we take each of the basis elements and map it according to this. And um, I will cut to the chase. I'll assume that you could apply this to each of these basis elements up here, or at least that you get it. And um, I'll just write the matrix. So since there are four matrix uh, basis elements, we'll have a four by four matrix. And uh, just like before, I'll call this P1, P2, P3, P4. And then let's just uh, summarize the matrix gives us the four by four matrix. We'll get negative two lambda, zero, 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 and then negative lambda plus lambda bar, zero, 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 minus two lambda bar, zero, and then zero, 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 lambda minus three lambda bar. And now remember we're evaluating at mu equals zero. So lambda equals negative i omega, lambda bar, or sorry, lambda equals i omega, lambda bar is negative i omega. Uh, so what's gonna happen here? So lambda, plus lambda bar equals zero because they're purely imaginary. So that means this, um, this term is zero. And we do the evaluation at mu equals zero. So um, this matrix is not a full rank. Um, and 
we can eliminate so that corresponding term cannot be eliminated that is the, the second element so this one z squared z bar cannot be eliminated so we can eliminate all third order terms except z squared z bar. All right. So in the new variables, right, once we've done the we've done the second order change of variables and now the third order change of variables, we have z dot equals lambda. It's a function of mu times z plus and all right, there's some coefficient complex coefficient c that's a function of mu times z squared z bar plus and then terms of order four so this is uh, for some complex coefficient c that's a function of mu um, it actually turns out that we can eliminate all even order terms if you were to continue this computation. So this thing that I've written as order four, it's actually order five. So this is, this would be called the Hopf normal form written in complex uh, coordinates, but we want to go back to the real coordinates because uh, things will be easier to interpret there. So go back to the real variables. Uh, Z equals X plus I Y. Okay. Uh, we'll also just to remind ourselves, how did we write lambda? Lambda was alpha mu plus i omega as a function of mu. And c, this complex conjugate or complex coefficient, we'll write it as a plus uh, i b, where both a and b are real, and functions of mu. Okay, what do we get? We get, so the real variables, in terms of real variables, I mean, it looks really pretty in terms of complex variables. It doesn't look so pretty in real variables. Just to tell you that up front. Uh, so we get a alpha x minus omega y. This is omega x minus alpha y, right? This is the part that's lambda z. And then uh, the third order term, we, this ends up looking like ax minus by x squared plus y squared. And over here, bx minus ay, or plus, sorry, ay, x squared plus y squared. And then the next leading order term would be order five. Okay, so this was this is just writing c z squared z bar. All right, it doesn't look so pretty. Um, we'll make it look prettier. We will. Now let me let me go back to what what's the situation in terms of how the eigenvalues are changing. The eigenvalues. Right, at mu equals zero, we've got uh, i omega zero and negative i omega zero. But these eigenvalues, and you know, they must remain complex conjugates, so they're mirror images of each other. Um, what I'm showing here is it's a leading order. In 
mu alpha mu, the real part of the eigenvalues equals d mu, d is just a constant. There's no constant terms. The first thing is linear in mu where um, d is you know, non-zero. Here I've shown, I'm showing here the case for d greater than zero. So as mu increases, we're crossing from the left half plane to the right half plane, okay? And uh, you know, d is a constant. Um, so we're writing the real part alpha mu equals d mu plus something second order in mu. So um, with d greater than zero, that means the equilibrium point goes from being unstable, no, being stable to unstable, right? Because having your two eigenvalues in the left half plane means stable, and then right half plane, the real part's positive, so it goes unstable. And right along the imaginary axis, oh wow, we have a 2D center manifold. And what do you know, related to center manifolds, there's, there's gonna be bifurcations, this thing called the Hopf bifurcation. Uh, so in the, in the Cartesian coordinates, X and Y, this doesn't look very pretty. So we go into polar coordinates. instead of Cartesian. So that means go from X and Y to R and theta. If you want, you can go directly from Z to R and theta via Z equals R E to the I theta. You know, that way to write complex uh, variables in terms of the argument and the, the modulus. And what do we get? Um, R dot equals alpha R plus A R cubed plus the next leading order term is R to the R to the fifth. This is an equals. And theta dot equals omega plus B R squared plus the next leading order term being R to the fourth. So this is the usual way that the Hopf normal form is written. It's written in, in polar coordinates. And uh, when we look at solutions of this, you'll see why. Um, if you wanted to follow along in the book's discussion, this is equation 19.2.34. So this is the Hopf bifurcation normal form written in polar coordinates, which is the usual way that it does get written. Um, I guess you could look at this and try to recognize, oh, hey, uh, I see some symmetries here. Maybe this would look good in terms of polar coordinates, but there it is. And What do we get? Um, things depend on, right, we've written, up here we've written that the leading order term, that alpha can be written as d mu plus mu squared. And the sign of d matters, okay? Um, the sign of d determines uh, what type of hop bifurcation? And this is what happens um, for mu. So let, let's let's assume. Let's look at the case d greater than zero. 
for the case d greater than zero, um, let's see, for mu greater than zero, well, yeah, it depends on not just the sign of D, but the sign of A. A periodic orbit shows up, or it's kind of, it's birthed near the origin. with an amplitude r equals square root negative d mu over a with a period t equals two pi over omega. So the cases depend on the sign of d and the sign of a. So let me show you, um, I'll show you a little video where I think D is greater than zero. So if A is less than zero, right? You get this thing of like D mu divided by magnitude of A. So as mu increases, you get something. Um, let me just do a little sketch. Remember how we were looking at Sort of x, one, I guess I call them x and y towards the end. x and y, and then here's the mu axis. So we'll have a, a point that's stable. Things are kind of spiraling in. Um, before we reach the hopped bifurcation point, so this is the, the hopped bifurcation. And after that, the Equal, the origin becomes unstable, but a periodic orbit is birthed. It sort of looks like a 2D version of the um, pitchfork di diagram, but things sort of come in here and we'll spiral around that. And these are, this is periodic orbit. I think I might have a nicer drawing made by um, professional. Uh, where is it? Hopped bifurcation right there. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty nice. Check that out. Yeah, here they, you know, they call this R because I don't know why, call it mu. So the, the origin, uh, changes stability and then we have a, a periodic orbit growing um i've got a movie too that, that shows this it's pretty cool and why this keeps going here uh, let's go to hot bifurcation this one Some music <laughs> for the shows. Pretty cool. The growth of the. See that going on. There's another view of just the vector field as a function of mu, and we've got initial conditions coming from the four sides. And, you could, and I think also coming out of the origin so you can see what happens. Uh, as we get further away, this periodic orbit grows. So I think this is called a supercritical hop bifurcation because you could have a, a stable periodic orbit showing up or you could have a, a unstable periodic orbit showing up. Uh, and it all depends on the signs of these, these parameters like uh, D and A so on. Um, so yeah, you could also have the case where um, there's an unstable, maybe I'll draw it in orange, an unstable periodic orbit 
which occurs as you're going from one way to the other. So this is unstable. It's kind of harder to draw. But all right, things want to get away from it. And the the origin is stable. And then after that, you're just left with a unstable equilibrium point. So things are spiraling away from the equilibrium point. So if I believe it's this case with the stable periodic orbit showing up, uh, uh, my, I think it's called supercritical. This supercritical and subcritical, it just means like, does something interesting happen for mu positive or mu negative? I think that's all it means. Um, but there's different cases um, that you can get. Often the way you'll see this depicted is uh, people will show some bifurcation diagram. So there'll be some parameter that they care about. And they're, they often show like a, here's a stable equilibrium point and then it becomes unstable, which they might show as dashed and a stable periodic orbit is birthed out of it. And they sort of make it look like it's a pitchfork diagram, but this is supposed to represent the extents of the amplitude of the orbit. And what often happens is the periodic orbit will actually then collapse again, and you'll be left with a stable equilibrium point. So it's kind of like you have a little bubble in uh, parameter space where some periodic orbit exists. Um, and in fact, we, uh, we saw this behavior in uh, one of our um, one of our studies, if I could, I'm able to find it. I'm not sure where I put it. Oh, maybe I called it a slow manifold. Don't know why. Oh, here's our preprint. So we have a paper on, we looked at a model, a 2D model of uh, gliding of animals that depended on some parameter like their angle of attack. And I can just get to the, this just sort of shows what the face space looked like and some example curves and trajectories. And then we eventually found, yeah, we had bifurcation diagrams we also found um, the periodic orbit showed up. So down here, this is an example of one of those cases. This is kinematic squirrel. This was the dynamics of a flying squirrel um, gliding. And at some point, a unstable, an unstable limit cycle shows up. Um, and we didn't quite follow it. It sort of went beyond the region where we had data. But it was interesting that in this model, we found uh, a hops bifurcation and then um, there's a giant appendix where we analyze the hop bifurcation. So we will, we will talk about um, the hop bifurcation more later when we go through uh, when we talk about bifurcations, because there, there are some simpler ways to find out if you have this case going on. So, so how to detect in the original system if you have a Hopf bifurcation? So without doing all of these normal forms, there's ways to find out. Um, so by original system, I mean the original vector field. So we'll find out later. In the main uh, bifurcation discussion. So that is, that's it for today. Um, hopefully you, you learned some things uh, using you know, normal forms that depend on parameters, some more practice and just sort of using it and how it gives you insight into certain types of bifurcations that happen. 
hop bifurcation is particularly important because it, it is seen in actual systems. It's considered structurally robust. Um, other bifurcations you don't quite really see in systems like pitchfork bifurcations, but this one, it's robust to perturbations. So you could see it in real systems. Uh, and so it becomes a concern. There's this thing about like in aero elasticity where the wings can oscillate I think it's called limit cycle oscillations and it's a it's a hop bifurcation so you always want to design the specifications of aircraft so that doesn't happen um, and there's other cases as well so that's it uh any any final questions if not i'll, I'll sign off and have a good weekend uh, we'll continue Tuesday morning.